Hello and welcome to my channel, where we delve into fascinating historical topics from the distant past. In today's video, we'll explore the renowned elephant battle known as the Songkram Yudahadi in Thailand. This duel between crown princes Naruswan and Mingyi Swa in 1593 has captivated audience through romantic tales, often portrayed as a historic battle that liberated Ayutthaya from Myanmar's Tonggu dynasty. At present, there are approximately 10 versions of the story written in Thai from that time period, accompanied by several foreign sources referencing these events. But before we embark on the historical journey, I want to express my gratitude for visiting my channel, and I hope you'll enjoy the upcoming video. According to one of the most widely popular accounts, the confrontation took place between Siamese and Burmese forces in Nong Sarai. Naraswan and his brother Ekan Hosarat, riding elephants, charged fearsomely into the Burmese army with only a handful of Siamese soldiers following their lead. Surrounded and aware of the perilous situation, Naraswan spotted Mingyi Swa who was commanding his troops from a shaded tree. Naraswan called out to Mingyi Swa, challenging him to engage in single combat. Determined to prove his bravery, Mingyi Swa accepted the challenge, and atop their elephants, the two princes engaged in a fierce duel. Meanwhile, Akat Tot Sarat faced off against a Burmese general. Ultimately, the Thai brothers emerged triumphant, slaying the Tonggu crowned prince and the general, which forced the Burmese army into retreat. However, it's worth noting that the Burmese chronicles do not mention the duel at all, despite its popularity in Thailand. According to Burmese sources, Mingyi Swa was killed by a stray bullet from a Siamese firearm. The accounts differ in specific details surrounding the event, leading some historians to question the authenticity of the battle in Nong Sarai in 1593. Nevertheless, the majority of historians agree that some form of clash between Naru Swan and Mingyi Swa did occur, as most sources indicate. In this video, I aim not to settle the debate regarding the occurrence or precise details of the event. Given the limitations of time travel, we may never have a definitive answer. Instead, my objective is to provide a historical context for the Songkram Yudahadi and comprehend its significance in history. So without further delay, let's delve into the subject. The use of elephants in warfare can be traced back to ancient times. Evidence suggests that war elephants were employed as early as the post-Vedic period in India, around 500 BCE, and possibly even earlier during China's Shang Dynasty from the 17th through 12th century BCE. Epics from India and the Jatakas mention elephants' involvement in major military operations, a notable reference is found in the accounts of Alexander the Great's invasion of the Upper Indus Valley in 376 BCE. The Greek historian Diodorus, writing in the 1st century BCE, reports that the king of Porus, who opposed Alexander's army, had approximately 200 elephants at the Battle of Hydespes. War elephants held a crucial role in ancient armies. They served as the vanguard of marching forces, clearing paths and camping grounds by removing trees and shrubs. In combat, they proved to be the most powerful and highly mobile siege weapons, capable of demolishing walls, gates, and fortress towers. Furthermore, they could disrupt enemy lines by scattering and trampling hostile forces. Importantly, war elephants also functioned as mobile elevated command posts, where kings or commanders could stand on the front lines, issuing orders and boosting troop morale. These formidable creatures were often adorned with brass or steel plates protecting their heads and were fully armored, instilling fear in their adversaries. The practice of elephant taming likely originated long before their use in warfare. Agricultural societies in India and Southeast Asia employed domesticated elephants to clear forests for planting, a tradition that spans millennia. The methods of training elephants for military purposes likely spread from ancient India to Southeast Asia, as evidenced by the Khmer Empire's utilization of war elephants as early as the 9th century AD. The practice of single combat elephant duels, although of unknown origins, had become a ritualized tradition among Southeast Asian monarchs, royal family members, and prominent military leaders. The earliest recorded instance of elephant duels can be found in the Mahavamsa, a Pali chronicle from 6th century Ceylon. 
In this chronicle, King Dutta Hagamani engaged in an elephant duel with a Tamil king from southern India. As Theravada Buddhism spread, so did the practice of elephant duels into Southeast Asia. The earliest reference to elephant duels in Southeast Asia comes from 13th century Sukhothai, where King Ramkam Hang fought a single combat on the back of an elephant against a rival king from Wang Chalt. Another example comes from 1424 following the death of the king of Ayutthaya. Two of his sons vied for the throne through an elephant duel, resulting in the demise of both contenders. Thai Chronicles contain several accounts of elephant duels, with the most famous being Naru Swan's victory over Ming Yi Swa. Burmese Chronicles also mention elephant duels. For example, in 1551 during the siege of Pegu by King Banyan Nog of the Tongu dynasty, he engaged and defeated Pegu's king in single combat on a war elephant. Similarly, in 1584, Nandan Bayin, Bayin Nog's grandson, fought an elephant duel against his uncle, the king of Ava, and emerged victorious. Based on these examples, it does appear that there's a strong correlation between elephant duels and kingship within both Thailand and Burma during this time. While the outcome of a duel could be disastrous for both the kingdom and the army if their ruler or military commander fell in combat, it is important to note that not all of these duels resulted in death. Although many elephant duels undoubtedly claimed the lives of one or both participants, it was not always a fight to the death. The use of real weapons and elephants did entail significant risk. However, these duels were often ritualized confrontations in which opposing parties mounted their heavily armed war elephants and charged at each other. The duel concluded when the opponent was disarmed, wounded, unseated, or incapacitated. Mortal combat was not always the norm in these duels. For example, King Ram Kam Heng did not kill the ruler of Muang Chot, but instead compelled him to acknowledge Mong Chot as a vassal state to Ayutthaya. Similarly, Nandan Bayan did not kill his uncle, the king of Pegu, in their duel, and instead allowed him to live. Typically, elephant duels were arranged when initial skirmishes between opposing armies failed to indicate a clear advantage for either side, often occurring when two major armies were of comparable strength. The purpose was to avoid extensive casualties, as prolonged stalemates could result in mutual destruction for both armies. Even if one side eventually emerged victorious, they would be less significantly weakened. To mitigate this, kings would negotiate individual duels between people of similar rank, thus minimizing large-scale killing and destruction. For instance, Portuguese sources suggest that the duel between Nara Swan and Ming Yi Swa was orchestrated to prevent a protracted and costly battle. In some versions of the Songkram Yudahadi, it is mentioned that Ming Yi Swa agreed to duel Nara Swan on the condition that Nara Swan acknowledged the legitimacy of the Tangu dynasty and end his rebellion. This indicates that the duel was not intended to be lethal. However, these duels occurred with real weapons and dangerous elephants, so there would always be the possibility for one party to be seriously injured. Elephant duels held a significant place within the realms of Thai and Burmese kingship. Drawing inspiration from the Sri Lankan epic, the Mahavamsa, and King Dutahagamani's elephant duel to protect Buddhism and bring glory to the doctrine. The kings of Burma and the Thai states seem to have been influenced by this concept. Southeast Asian kingship was rooted in the notion of Chakravartin, the righteous ruler whose chariot wheels would roll unobstructed across the world. Although Chakravartin originated in Brahmanism, it gained importance within Buddhist cosmology as it spread from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia. Historians have suggested that the idea of a universal sovereign within the Chakravartin concept helps explain the seemingly endless conflicts and military campaigns between states in India and Southeast Asia. While the Chakravartin concept has been associated with nonviolence and rulership through Dharma and peaceful means, Kings often took their status as Chakravartin seriously and eliminated rivals to maintain power. It was typically through militaristic means rather than peaceful strategies that kings sought to establish and uphold their status as Chakravartin. 
The Thai and Burmese dynasties perceived elephant duels as a way to manifest their rightful status as universal sovereigns or Chakravartin within their realms. One of the main reasons why Ming Yi Swa might have agreed to the elephant duel with Naraswan was to establish the legitimacy of the Tongu dynasty and prove his worthiness as the crown prince and successor to his father. By the time Ming Yi Swa's father, Nanda Bayan, ascended the throne of Pegu, he inherited an empire that was vastly overextended. His father, Bayan Nog, had expanded the power of the Tongu dynasty across Southeast Asia, conquering Ava and Chiang Mai, expanding into the Lao kingdoms of Lanshang, and capturing Ayutthaya. However, after Bayanog's death in 1581, his successors struggled to suppress rebellions, and the power of the Tongu dynasty slowly began to disintegrate. Ming Yi Swa's victory in the elephant duel against Naraswan would have provided a significant boost to the legitimacy of the Tongu dynasty. However, Naraswan emerged victorious and his fame spread across Southeast Asia. His victory allowed Ayutthaya to regain its lost political influence, which had been diminished when the Tongu dynasty reduced the city to vassalage three decades earlier. Thai armies advanced into Tongu territory, capturing Tavoy and Tanasarim, and fought wars to liberate neighboring Thai states. Vassal states that were once loyal to the Tongu court shifted their loyalty to Naraswan and refused to send tribute to Pegu. Although the Tongu dynasty managed to survive until the middle of the 18th century, their power eventually collapsed by the end of the 16th. Naraswan, on the other hand, ascended to the throne of Ayutthaya in 1590 and led several successful campaigns against the Burmese in Khmer. He is remembered as one of the greatest kings in Siamese chronicles, alongside Thailand's second great liberator, Taksin. After Naraswan's victory at Nong Sarai, Ayutthaya would eventually reach its height of power after the collapse of the Tongu Empire and the threats from Burma eased between 1605 and 1767. However, ultimately Ayutthaya would fall to another Burmese attack in 1767, but that's a story for another time. The 16th century also marked the end of the centuries-long tradition of the elephant duel. The introduction of firearms and artillery diminished the significance of elephants in warfare. Riding on the back of an elephant made kings and military leaders vulnerable targets for opposing gunners while artillery fire replaced the role that elephants once played as siege weapons. The famous duel between Naraswan and Mingyi Swa in Nong Sarai would be remembered as the most illustrious duel of honor and the final great elephant duel before the tradition faded away in the 17th century. And that concludes our brief history of the Songkram Yudahadi. Thank you for visiting and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like and subscribe to support the channel and stay tuned for future updates. And also a special thank you to one of my subscribers for suggesting this topic. If you have any of your own that you'd like to hear in the future, please let me know in the comments below. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care and goodbye.